The Boys, Volume 4. We Gotta Go Now, written by Garth Ennis, art by Derek Robertson. This covers issues 23 to 30. So Volume 4 deals with characters called the G-Men, and the G-Men are basically the X-Men. So it's really kind of fun seeing Garth Ennis take on the X-Men and parody them, and you see tons of analogs to various X-Men characters, whether it be Wolverine or Jean Grey or Cyclops or Storm. So it's kind of fun seeing those those jabs there. And there's also an interesting parody of Animal House in this volume, which is really funny as well. Now, the sexual perversion, once again, in this volume is ramped up. And it's funny. It's funny. Sometimes it's a little bit much, though. But nevertheless, I still really enjoyed this volume. So let's dive into the story. Issue 23, We Gotta Go Now, Part 1 of 7. So the story opens up, and there are two workers in a Von American's weapons warehouse, and they are loading up some M2A1 flamethrowers for what purpose we do not know yet. We see Huey and Annie's relationship is going well. They are now sleeping together regularly at Huey's place. Here we see them cuddling together in the morning. Then we go over to Susan Rayner and she is talking to Butcher and she says something is wrong with the G-Men. Now Susan explains that there is this woman named Grace Wilhelm who goes by the superhero name Silver Kincaid. And she is a member of the G-Men. She is the equivalent of Jean Grey in the X-Men universe. So she's like Jean Grey. And she apparently has these gravity control powers. And she recently used it on herself and killed herself yesterday morning, seemingly randomly. So we see a scene of this suicide go down. This silver Kincaid, she is standing in the middle of this little nothing town in western Massachusetts called Cranbrook. She has apparently been standing there for hours. Eventually, someone comes up to her and asks her what's wrong, and she says, Where's Uncle Paul? And then she appears to use her powers on herself and kills herself all gory-like. So Susan's explaining that it's kind of a big deal that she killed herself. She is one of the original leading members of the first team of the actual G-Men. Not one of the sister teams. She's on the main important team. So apparently when Silver Kincaid killed herself, someone filmed the body and put up the video on YouTube. Vought American heard about this, saw it in the, on the internet, and they showed up at the scene and they had fake IDs and they claimed they worked for the CIA and the government and they took the remains of Silver Kincaid away in an effort to sort of keep everything on the down low. So Susan wants Butcher and the boys to investigate this. Vought American was trying to cover it up and there seems to be all sorts of crazy shenanigans going on with the G-Men. So she wants Butcher and the boys to look into this. Butcher says uh, they will and then Butcher and Susan Rayner have a quick sex session in the restroom. Susan hates Butcher, but she just can't help herself. Back at the boys headquarters, Butcher and Huey, who did his homework on the G-Men, is giving everyone a briefing on the deal with the G-Men and an overview of their whole sort of organization. So who are the G-Men? They are a parody of the X-Men. They are Vought Americans' most bankable team as well as their most popular team. Vaughn American made one billion last year from the G-Men, and the G-Men were founded by this guy named John S. Godalkin, and he is a parody of Charles Xavier. So he is the Charles Xavier to the G-Men, basically. And this Godalkin, he got the first team of kids together when they were just orphans, and then they went out looking for more soup kids that were getting picked on by the authority and got them to join his group. Now, it's sort of hinted at in the first few issues that there is something a little bit nefarious with this Godalkin. We don't find out really what's going on entirely until the end of the story arc, but I'm just going to be upfront about what the deal is. So this Godalkin is apparently an unrepentant pedophile and kidnapper, and all the G-Men team members were abused by him since childhood, making them all detest him. However, despite this, all the G-Men remain loyal to him and never said anything to other people about it, and they kept it all a secret. So there is definitely a culture of secrecy within the G-Men. 
Now we learned that one of the G-Men, Nubia, who is a parody of Storm, she has flight, weather control, and lightning powers. So this Nubia, she went crazy a few years ago. She was tossing lightning bolts down the road from a nuclear power plant, no one knew why, but they had to bring in Silver Kincaid to use her gravity control powers on Nubia and collapse Nubia's heart, killing her. It's all very secret. But Nubia has been killed, but she's been seen walking around since being killed, meaning she has also been reanimated as a zombie, sort of like Blarney Cock and the Lamplighter were reanimated. So we have a zombie Nubia running around. So going forward and looking at all the G-Men, so there are various groups of the G-Men, just like the X-Men have various teams. So the main team is the G-Men, and that is like the main member. So you have John Godalkin at the top, the Xavier figure. You got Groundhawk. He is basically a parody of Wolverine, except he's got hammers for hands. There's Critter. He is the Beast parody. There's the Divine, and he is a parody of Angel. And in this case, he's in an openly gay relationship with uh, another G-Force member called Flamer. There's Nubia, who's Storm. There's Silver Kincaid, who's Jean Grey. And then there's 5-0, -Oh, who's Cyclops. So that's sort of the main team. There's also uh, another team called G-Force. They're sort of like a parody of X-Force. There's the G-Brits. They're like a parody of Excalibur, the British X-Men team in the UK. There is the G-Nomads. There's also G-Coast and G-Style. And they are an entirely African-American G-Men team. And they are constantly engaged in an over-the-top parody of rapper feuds with one another. So it's these two African-American groups and they constantly hate each other and are just sort of battling with each other. There's also G-Wiz and they're a team of frat boys in their mid-twenties. And they eventually hope to graduate onto the G-Men. And there's also another group called Pre-Wiz and they are uh, like little toddler uh, G-Men, probably around age five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that is sort of your overview of the G-Men. There are so many members, somewhere between 50 to 80 to 100. And you know, there's all these teams and they're all comprised of a few people. Butcher's plan to take down the G-Men is to get a member of the boys on the inside going undercover. And in this case, it's gonna be Huey that is doing that task. Huey is gonna join G-Wiz, which is the younger G-Men team. They are kind of like frat boys. They live off campus from the main G mansion, but eventually when Huey joins G Wiz, they're eventually gonna have to go to the G mansion for G class. And when they're there, Huey can plant some bugs so the boys can spy on them. Huey has to get into a superhero outfit to join this team. And when he puts it on, he looks ridiculous. He feels that Butcher just keeps him around to be the butt end of his jokes. And Butcher Frenchman and Mother's Milk just, just can't contain their laughter and they are dying at Huey in his superhero outfit. Huey is gonna go by the superhero name, Bagpipe. Going over to issue 24, we gotta go now part two. We see the cover of this issue is a straight up parody of the 1978 movie, National Lampoon's Animal House. And this whole issue is very reminiscent of that movie in some ways. So we see Huey, he's already been integrated with the members of G-Wiz and he is hanging out at their frat house and they are there's a toga party going on and Huey meets the various members of G-Wiz. So there is Randall, known by the superhero name Buzzcut. There's Corey, also known as Pinwheel. There's Jamal, going by the name Dimebag. There's Sugar, with the superhero name Jetlag. Weezer, also known as Airburst and Blochowski, also known as Discharge. Blochowski is easily my favorite member of G-Wiz. He's a straight up parody of John Belushi in Animal House. He's fat, he's a mess, he's vomiting in an aquarium in this opening scene, and he fires acidic vomit from his mouth. And sort of the last member of G-Wiz is a guy named the dude with no name. He's apparently a guy who's been at G-Wiz for generations, but he's never graduated on to the other teams. He's kind of a legend to these guys. You think of like the older dude in a college frat boy movie that is way older than everyone. He's been there for like eight or 10 years, but he's still there. He's still sort of hanging out, spaced out in the background. That is the dude with no name. 
So basically, Chiwiz lives like frat boys, they like to party, and they even have a porno room with over 20,000 titles. So jumping over to Mother's Milk now, Mother's Milk is trying to investigate the death of this Silver Kincaid. So he's going to visit this sh Sheriff Roger Davenport up in Cranbrook. And he, this Roger Davenport was the guy that witnessed Silver Kincaid kill herself. So Mother's Milk is talking to this sheriff, but this sheriff doesn't know why the Silver Kincaid woman was in town. So Mother's Milk wants to check the town records and see if he can figure it out. He He's working under this theory that Silver Kincaid was somehow in this town before in her past. Now jumping over to Butcher, Butcher couldn't sleep, so he decided to go visit the legend and catch up. We learned that the legend set Huey up with some sort of fake identification papers, which should buy Huey a few days before the G-Men check in with Vod American and figure out that Huey isn't actually some hero named Bagpipe. So using the legend's connections, they were able to get Huey this fake ID, and that is how Huey has integrated himself in with G-Wiz. Back over at the G-Wiz frat house, Huey sees G-Wiz members prank calling the Seven, which is really funny. So G-Wiz is talking to Jack from Jupiter on the phone from the Seven, and they're saying, suck my dick, jerk off from Jupiter, homo lander, put Mave on, I wanna come on her tits. <laughs> so the Seven are listening in on this phone call and they are really pissed. G-Wiz are all laughing hysterically. Jack from Jupiter is on the phone threatening them. Eventually Annie takes the phone away from Jack from Jupiter. And then G-Wiz puts Huey on the phone and they're like, Huey, say something to them. And uh, Huey yells something about A-Train. And then Annie is on the other line. And Annie thinks she almost recognizes Huey's voice. And then Huey almost thinks that he recognizes Annie's voice, but both of them sort of deny it and then they hang up. So sort of a close call here for both of their sort of secret lives. Next day, Huey and G-Wiz are all in the car and they are driving over to the G mansion and Blochowski is smoking a joint in the back and they're all talking about the death of Silver Kincaid and how hot she was. But Blochowski, he's like, nah, man, I like Nubia. <laughs> but some of the other g -Wiz members are like, I don't know, man, Nubia doesn't seem that right now. And they're referring to her being a zombie. So I kind of love this scene. I was just picturing the X-Men talking about Jean Grey and how hot she was. So that was a really funny scene here. Eventually, g -Wiz pull up to the spacious G-Mansion and John Godalkin himself and his various G-Men are there to greet Huey and G-Wiz. Issue 25, we gotta go now, part three. So James Stillwell is meeting with his boss. I believe this guy's name is Stan Edgar, the CEO of Vought American. I could be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure that's who this is. James wants another AV-8 aircraft after Homelander destroyed the other one in one of his tantrums last volume. So remember when Homelander destroyed that airplane? Well, uh, James wants to get another one for the seven. James explains that the Homelander is sadistic, self-centered, and petty, but he never loses his temper in any way that actually counts. So the Homelander can still be trusted here. Uh, James and his boss go on to discuss the G-Men. Apparently the G-Men have a slightly different relationship than the other hero teams under Vaught American. The G-Men were formed independently by John Godalkin upon the original G-Team being deemed ready and Godalkin, he sought out a working relationship with Vaught American, thus bringing the G-Men under the Vaught American umbrella, but still giving the G-Men a little bit of independence to operate outside of another group like Teenage Kicks or Payback or something. So the G-Men are under Vaught American, but a little bit separate. So James and his boss are starting maybe regretting this independence. After what happened with Silver Kincaid and Nubia, it may be time for Vaughn American to step back in and contain the situation with the G-Men. Jumping back over to Huey, he is now meeting the G-Men and all its various team members. The G-Men member Groundhawk is all in Huey's face. Now remember Groundhawk is a parody of Wolverine, except I thought this was so funny. He has hammers for hands instead of claws, which is just so stupid, but so it looks so funny in the book. And for some reason, he has a tendency to growl the word gonna. 
So he just keeps repeating that over and over again. While Huey is meeting the G-Men, Frenchman and the female are surveilling the situation to make sure Huey doesn't get into any trouble. Huey says hello to John Godalkin, who seems a bit dismissive of Huey and not very interested in him. He doesn't like the fact that he has to take in this random soup from Bot American, because that is who Huey is pretending to be which is what Huey's forged papers show. Huey hands over these forged papers to Godalkin's underling, another G-Man named Critter, who is the Beast parody, and uh, Godalkin just kind of says whatever, and Huey steps inside. So Huey and G-Wiz start walking around the G-Mansion, and they head over to the kitchen. Blochowski is drinking some beer. Huey starts planting some of those bugs. Uh, they are talking all about the upcoming funeral for Silver Kincaid, and all the G-Men are supposed to go, as well as all of the underling sister teams of the G-Men. Eventually, the G-Men, known as 5-0, comes into the kitchen. He is the Cyclops parody. And when he's talking about Silver Kincaid's death, he refers to her as a prick-teasing bitch, possibly indicating some unreturned sexual advances. So basically, imagine Scott Summers if Jean Grey rejected him. That's basically what's going on with 5-0. Jumping over to Mother's Milk, he's continuing his investigation into Silver Kincaid. He has this theory that Silver Kincaid perhaps lived or visited Cranbrook, Massachusetts at some point before she died. Uh, and before she did die, she asked for her Uncle Paul. So right now, that is what Mother's Milk is working off of. He's trying to figure out who this Uncle Paul is and what his connection is to Silver Kincaid. Back over at the G-Mansion, Huey's planting some bugs in the bathroom and the zombie Nubia shows up and she is just repeating the phrase, kill me, kill me, and it kind of freaks Huey the fuck out. <laughs> Luckily, G-Wiz comes in the bathroom and calms Huey down, and they all explain that's just what Nubia says now, that's, that's all she says. And then John Godalkin walks in and some of the other G-Men, and they say, oh, I thought we put an end to her little excursions. They should, uh, and then they go escort her away. Huey asks Godalkin, why do you keep Nubia here? And Godalkin explains, because she's my little girl, just like the rest of them. They're my children, every last one. Later on in the evening, Huey checks in with the Frenchman and explains all the various bugs he's planted. And he's going to try to do the rest tomorrow and finish up. Uh, then Huey's walking through G Wiz's frat house because they're back home for the night. And he walks by the porno room in the G Wiz frat house. And all six members of G Wiz are watching porn together and jerking each other off. And Huey is obviously weirded out by this. And he's also confused because they're all watching straight porn. So they're not exactly gay, but they're all jerking each other off. It's very weird, to say the least. Uh, we also have a scene with Butcher. So Butcher paid a prostitute to seduce Kessler, that CIA analyst that works with Susan Rayner. And this Kessler also has a thing for paraplegics. That's sort of like his fetish. So while Kessler is sort of busy talking to this prostitute, Butcher sort of sneaks into Kessler's place and steals Kessler's computer hard drive to sort of get some information off of it. This comes into play later on in the volume. Issue 26, we gotta go now, part four. By the way, check out the cover for this issue. It's a parody of the original X-Men number 100 from 1976. And I thought it was really fun looking at the comparison of the two. The X-Men one is like touting their 100th issue, which is actually a milestone. But the boys is just like touting its 26th issue. <laughs> and it's funny when you look at the location of all the X-Men and all the G-Men and uh, their parodies are supposed to be representing. So uh, I thought it was really fun uh, looking at these covers. I stared at them for quite a bit. So diving into this issue, Huey says hello to G-Wiz in the morning and all six of them are showering together and laughing and having a good time. Blobchowski is peeing on them. It's like this typical frat boy camaraderie except a little bit messed up. So Huey is talking to Butcher on the phone and all the bugs are in place now. So his part of the mission is kind of done now. But Huey says that he wants to stay undercover with this G-Wiz a little bit longer. Partly for curiosity, partly because, sure they're weird, but they seem like 
legitimately good guys to Huey. And Huey wants to see if he can somehow help them from turning out like the rest of the G-Men, which all seem all angry and bitter and resenting everybody. Where G-Wiz, they're like fun-loving guys and they're all having fun and they're all friends. So, so Huey really wants to make a difference in their lives and sort of help them out. Butcher allows it. He tells Huey to follow his nose, but keep in mind, there's still soups, and once a soup, always a soup. So be vi be vigilant and pay attention. Later on in the day, Huey and Annie spend some time together. They make love outside. Afterwards, they are walking, and Annie asks about Huey's job. Now, Huey's lying to her at this point. He's pretending to be an insurance claim inspector. And he then asks about Huey's thoughts on superheroes and Huey kind of brushes it off and says he doesn't really think about them that much. So Huey's kind of lying a little bit to Annie here, although Annie's not being fully truthful about who she is either. Back over at the G Mansion, the G Men are all having brunch at God Alkin's place. <laughs> they are discussing Huey being a new member and that maybe they have too many members in the G Men. It's not good for security. Someone might say something. While the brunch is going on, we see Groundhog, who's that Wolverine with hammer hands. And I thought this was funny. He's struggling to hold his juice glass with his hammer hands, so he's struggling to drink it. <laughs> And um, Critter, he makes a comment about the Divine and Flamer buying a diamond-studded cock ring because they're both in a gay relationship with one another. And Flamer sees this as some sort of homophobic remark about their openly gay relationship. And uh, also at the other end of the table, we have some of the G-Men and they're feeding a zombie Nubia. So just some of these little small interactions going on in this brunch are really fun. So the G-Men are talking about how all the various G-teams and groups are coming for the funeral of Silver Kincaid soon, and they are worried that G-Coast and G-Style, the two African-American teams, are both going to be coming to the funeral and they're worried that they're going to be beefing with each other the whole time and causing up all sorts of fights with each other. And they don't really know how they're going to keep the peace between the two teams. Critter also says that Vought American emailed back about Huey and how they can't find them in their system. At this point, the G-Men are not too concerned at the moment, but uh, Huey's cover won't hold for too much longer. The Frenchman, who's listening in on this conversation with those bugs that Huey planted, he's a little concerned about this. So uh, he's going to maybe want to pull Huey out. Jumping back over to Mother's Milk. He's going around town questioning people, looking for a connection to this Uncle Paul that Silver Kincaid said before she died. Eventually, it leads him to a guy named Mr. Wilhelm. Issue 27, We Gotta Go Now, Part 5. Mother's Milk is talking to this Mr. Wilhelm, and we learn that Wilhelm is the father of Grace Wilhelm, who is Silver Kincaid. So we're talking to Silver Kincaid's dad, and this Uncle Paul that Silver Kincaid mentioned killed himself because of Silver Kincaid because apparently when Silver Kincaid was a little girl, her Uncle Paul, who loved her very much, took her for ice cream, but he forgot his change in the store, so he just went back in and to get the change, came back out 30 seconds later, and Silver Kincaid was gone, probably kidnapped, and they never found her. Mr. Wilhelm's wife, Anna, eventually got cancer, probably due to her intense anguish over her missing daughter. And this Uncle Paul, eventually he killed himself two years later out of guilt. So this Wilhelm has not had a great life since his daughter has been missing all these years. So Mother's Milk now has to figure out who abducted Silver Kincaid when she was just a little girl, but he's starting to really get further along in his investigation. Back over at he Huey, it's St. Patrick's Day, and everyone is drunk and vomiting in the street. Blochowski is mooning people and licking his nipple. <laughs> they all head into a bar, and Huey is talking to Randall, and he's trying to work on G-Wiz and trying to make them not turn into assholes like the rest of the G-Men. He's asking Randall questions, but Randall doesn't want to have a serious conversation right now. It's St. Patrick's Day, he just wants to party. And he does tell Huey, though, it's different for you, Huey. You didn't come up with us. You're from the outside. We've been in G-Wiz our whole lives. All we've ever knew was that we were going to be G-Men one day. It's just different when you're on the outside. It's not the same. All of a sudden, in the men's bathroom in this bar, all the members of G-Wiz are pissing on one of their teammates. 
and they all seem to be laughing about it and having a good time, even the guy getting pissed on. So once again, we see this frat boy camaraderie, but a little bit messed up version of that. Frenchman is on the phone and he warns Butcher that it's probably best to pull Huey out from being undercover because they're gonna spot his fake superhero ID soon. A few moments later, Huey joins Butcher in another bar and Butcher tells Huey, it's all getting too dodgy. You're out, man. You can't be undercover anymore. Huey protests a bit, but he accepts it. He just feels bad for G-Wiz, and he feels like someone really did a number on that team, as they're just a little messed up. He says, it's like they've been taught no boundaries, and they think their bodies and other people's bodies are just toys, and they've never been given any idea about what's sexually appropriate or not. And then when Butcher hears this, he's like, Blimey, Huey, what have you guys been up to? <laughs> So back at the G-Men mansion, both G-Coast and G-Style members have shown up and they're in the same room and they are beefing with one another and they are hurling insults at one another. And Cold Snap and 5-0 are watching it all go down from the sidelines. And Cold Snap and 5-0 start talking about God Alkin's pedophilia and what he did to them over the years. Apparently, one of the members of G-Coast named Cold Fry he blabbered about Godalkin's sexual advances with them to some hooker one day. And they had to sort of put an end to that. So they had to eliminate the hooker to keep it all quiet. It bothers Cold Snap a bit though. He says, I see those kids in G-Wiz figuring out how to deal with what we had to and I, at 5-0, he's one of the head members of the G-Men and he cuts off Cold Snap. And 5-0 says, you know what? I think life's pretty sweet most of the time. The money is awesome. And you know, sure, the other stuff, meaning God Alkin's sexual abuse, it's something you just learn to cope with. So it's interesting how 5-0 and the other G-Men as well, they don't like God Alkin's sexual abuse, but they put up with it, they accept it, and they protect the secret of it because it's better for business overall and the money is good. Issue 28, We Gotta Go Now, Part 6. So when this issue opens up, James Stillwell is on the phone with John Godalkin and they are discussing matters. Godalkin wants the body of Silver Kincaid back and he wants to resurrect her just like what was done with Nubia as well as Lamplighter. Uh, Stillwell says absolutely not to this. Also, while this conversation is going on, a whole bunch of brand new pre-Wiz kid members walk into John Godalkin's office and when Stillwell overhears this on the phone, he does not like the sound of it because this whole God Alkin pedophilia stuff is bad for business if it were to ever get out. And apparently God Alkin was supposed to put an end to the recruiting new kids and starting a new pre-wiz group, but here he is at it again. So Stillwell does not like the sound of this. Once their phone call wraps up, Stillwell notices an envelope his secretary left on his desk. And on it is the name Bagpipe, and it is about Huey, and how Huey from the boys has infiltrated the G-Men, and uh, Stowell is pissed that he did not have this information earlier. We assume he somehow eventually passes on this information to John Godalkin. Later on in the issue, Stillwell is talking to his boss at Bot American and informs him of the situation. He tells him that Bot American needs to step in and clean up the whole G-Men situation, even if they are big money makers. After this whole Silver Kincaid suicide business, this whole Nubia getting killed thing, Huey's infiltration, God Alkin starting up another pre-wiz group, things are just deteriorating there and it is kind of dangerous to leave them on the board. They, they just need to be taken care of. Now back at the G Mansion, they're all at the funeral for Silver Kincaid. We see they're all under a big statue of her and Huey decided to show up to the funeral. Despite Butcher telling him that it wasn't safe to stay undercover anymore, Huey just felt he had to be there to sort of help out G Wiz. So we also see Jamal and Blochowski, they are sharing a joint at the funeral and they're complaining that this service is going on way too long. So at this funeral, God Alkin is uh, saying a few words. Elsewhere in the crowd, zombie Nubia is drooling. They are wiping away the spit from her mouth. King Helmet 
of G style, then gets up to say a few words about uh, Silver. It starts out nice, he says. She was fine, she was true, a lady a brother could respect, etc, etc. But then his eulogy uh, reverts to a verbal attack on the rival members of G Coast. And then before you know it, G Coast members start yelling at King Helmet. And then both groups are yelling back and forth at each other. So meanwhile, while this whole scene is breaking out in the funeral, Jamal of G Wiz is talking to Huey and says, You know what's messed up? I gotta join one of those two groups when I graduate. I gotta join either G Coast or G Style, and I don't really want to. Wachowski is also bummed about the G Wiz team members eventually having to be separated once they all sort of graduate and move on. And he's sad they're not gonna all get to be buds anymore. Meanwhile, while this funeral is happening, Frenchmen and female are staking out the funeral and they are worried that Huey has showed up to it. After he was told to not be undercover anymore, they phone Butcher and Butcher hears about this, that Huey showed up and he gets pissed and he starts heading right over to come and save Huey. And he tells the Frenchman on the phone, grab Huey as soon as you can, start to move in. Now jumping over to the legend, he is doing the boys a favor. So Legend is on the phone with one of his old Victory Comics colleagues and he gets his colleague to give him a Vought American Network password for the day. Legend then gives this password to Mother's Milk who uses it to log into Vought American servers and Mother's Milk is going to try and see what kind of information he can get on the G-Men in Vought American's private computers. Jumping back over to Huey, him and the G-Wiz boys finally get to leave the funeral. They are driving away from the G-Mansion. But all of a sudden, they start taking a detour, and Huey starts getting suspicious. Randall pulls over somewhere secluded, and then he tells Huey, We know you're a spy. Get out of the car. So all the G-Wiz boys are disappointed in Huey for lying to them. Now Randall punches Huey in the face, although Huey's compound V powers are helping him withstand that punch. And Randall actually kind of hurts his hand from punching Huey. Uh, Blochowski says, we're gonna take you down, dude. And Randall says, cause that's what we do. Threats from the outside, threats from the inside, we take them down. Huey tries to talk some sense into them. He says, listen to yourselves. That's not you talking, that's God Alkin. You're no G men, you're just a bunch of kids. You're not like them. They hate each other and you can't stand them either. You have to get high just to deal with the memorial. You don't even like wearing the outfits unless you have to. You, you changed out of them the minute you knew we were gonna leave the funeral. I mean, are you really sure you wanna even be soups? Because honestly, fellas, you don't have to. I don't know what's been said or what's been done to you, but you don't have to do this. Now, Randall cuts Huey off, tells Blochowski to use his powers and kill Huey. Blochowski starts working up some sort of acidic vomit in his mouth. He projectile vomits at Huey, but Huey manages to dodge it. And then Huey says, listen to me. And then Huey all of a sudden stops and he's like, oh no, fellas, I'm so fucking sorry. The next thing you know, Frenchman and the female are behind G-Wiz, ready to fight, and then all of a sudden, blood splattering everywhere, Frenchman and the female have already taken out most of G-Wiz and killed them. Pinwheel, one of the members of G-Wiz, before getting killed, managed to get a psychic message out to the nearby G-Men, still at the funeral reception, so they've all been alerted to what's happening, and they're slowly gonna start making their way out to the field and confronting the boys. Frenchman and the female and Huey, meanwhile, are questioning this Jamal, who is the last surviving member of G-Wiz. He's the only one still alive. And then all of a sudden, Butcher and Mother's Milk show up to provide some backup. Butcher asks Jamal, where the fuck do the G-Men come from? And Jamal's confused by the question, but Mother's Milk explains, Silver Kid Cade wasn't from an orphanage. She got stolen from her family and her records were falsified with a fake orphanage. Same with all the other members of the G-Men I looked into, probably when he was getting into Vought American's computer network. So all that orphan outcast rebel stuff is a bullshit. How did God all can get you? What did he do to you to make you the way you are? And then Butcher steps in and he tells this Jamal, you tell us what the score is with the G-Men, all of it, don't leave nothing out, or Huey here is going to cut your throat.
Issue 29, we gotta go now, part 7. Jamal explains that God Alkin took them from their parents when they were kids. In Jamal's case, uh, God Alkin pulled up to Jamal in a limo with toys and candy and told them to get in. And at 6 years old, when someone is promising you, you can be a cool superhero and join the G-Men, you love the idea. But later, when you were at the G house for a few days and you get scared and want to go back home, he says no to you. That part of your life is all over now. You got to start your training. He says he knows it's hard, but you got to give everything up to be a G-Man. And before you know it, a few weeks go by, a month, you meet your others on the team, you have friends, you meet the older G-Man and they're all so cool. The whole thing is just an adventure and you go with it. Although Jamal did explain that. There was some kids that didn't necessarily go along with this bargain and they kind of had to be taken care of if they weren't so willing. Next comes the Compound V. They give you a shot every week until something starts to happen and some sort of power starts to develop. They train you and they raise you to protect the G-Men. That's the number one priority no matter what. And the more you grow up, you start to see why. There is so much money being a G-Men. It feels like you can have anything. More toys, more candy. By then, once you get older, you know what it really means to be a G-Men. You aren't going to be a real superhero. You are just there to cash in. And you will do anything to protect that. Even if it means killing rogue G-Men that want to share their secrets. Huey asks Jamal, but why do so many of them go mental in the first place? And Jamal explains about how God Alkin starts acting out sexually with the kids when they are about six years old or so. But no one wants to give up the free ride, so they go along with it and they sort of protect the secret. And when it really starts to bother certain people, certain G-men, and they can't take it anymore, they get taken care of. All of a sudden, while Jamal is speaking, the G-Man Europa, who's a parody of Nightcrawler, he pops up out of a portal and he punches and kills Jamal to stop him from talking. Then the rest of the G-Men show up to fight the boys. There's gotta be over 50 of them here out in this field and the boys march triumphantly to try and take all these G-Men down. So we're gonna have an epic battle here. Then all of a sudden though, some helicopters fly in and James Stilwell from Vought American is in one of them. He waves at God Alkin and God Alkin waves back and tells his G-Man it's okay because Vought American and the G-Man are partners, right? But then Stilwell and Vought American open fire on all the G-Men. They start mowing them all down. Rocket launchers as well as flamethrowers that were teased all the way back when this volume first opened up. Those very same flamethrowers are used. And then all the G-Men are dead and completely wiped out. Stilwell gets out of the helicopter and walks over to Butcher, who is standing there in awe of what just happened. And Stilwell says to Butcher, we can clean up our own shit. And then he leaves. Vought American dealt with their G-Men problem and any loose ends from it. As God Alkin and the G-Men were kind of going off the rails, so now that situation has been dealt with. Issue 30, Rodeo Fuck. This is an epilogue to We Gotta Go Now, so we're just sort of jumping to various people and see where they are after the fallout of this whole G-Man situation. So James Stilwell is on the phone and he explains that the Victory Comics people will make whatever explanation is required to spin all the G-Men dying into a proper story to cover it up. Stillwell is also taking all those pre-Wiz kids because they were the only G-Man that survived because they happened to not be on the battlefield at the time. And these little pre-Wiz kids, Stillwell has loaded them into a cargo box and they are being dumped off a plane in Iceland, maybe to their death? We don't know. I think to their death. We'll see. Huey and Butcher then are on a train and they are talking. Huey wishes some of the G-Wiz members didn't have to be killed. He really wanted to save them, but I guess that just wasn't in the cards. Frenchman and the female are outside this place called Uncle Joe's, and the female wants to go in and get another contract hit so she can kill someone and fulfill her need to kill. Now the Frenchman tries to talk her out of it, just like he succeeded doing a previous volume or so ago, 
but the female doesn't want to hear it this time, and she heads out anyway. The Frenchman touches her shoulder to stop her. She shoots him a dirty look because the female does not like to be touched. The female leaves the Frenchman, though, and she heads inside because the Frenchman's words do not stop her this day. Jumping over to Mother's Milk, he arrives at Mr. Wilhelm's place, Silver Kincaid's dad, and Mother's Milk is going to tell Wilhelm that his daughter is dead. We also learn that Mother's Milk has a daughter, Janine, and that Janine's mom isn't a good person. The mom went and took Janine away once, and Mother's Milk, with Butcher's help, tracked down and got Janine back. So we're sort of teasing some history here that we're going to get some explanation on in future volumes. James Stillwell and Homelander are talking, and Stillwell says, with G-Men off the board now, the Seven and the Homelander, they got to step up for some of that lost revenue. The marketing team has been kicking around some ideas to freshen up the Seven. New costumes, maybe, darker. We're thinking, they're thinking of making the Homelander blue, make Starlight's costume even skimpier. Homelander says, why are we wasting time on this costume talk when we should be dealing with Butcher? But Stillwell says, you know you can't kill Butcher. All the documents he has on the Seven would get out if you killed him. Stillwell is, however, giving the okay to attack and cripple some of the other members of the boys. This used to be sort of off the table, but Stillwell is kind of giving the okay to Homelander to go after some of the other boys' members. Butcher is talking with Kessler, apparently on that hard drive that Butcher stole a few issues ago from Kessler. Butcher found out that Susan Rayner has been talking with Silver Kincaid for three years. Apparently, Silver Kincaid reached out to Susan after the whole Nubia incident when she was forced to kill Nubia, and she was feeling bad, and she really wanted to sort of make a difference, so she reached out to Susan, and she was going to act as Susan's mole inside the G-Men. She was going to be Susan's spy, but Butcher is pissed that Susan Rayner withheld this information from the boys when sending them in to investigate the G-Men. Later on, when he and Susan are having sex, Butcher tells her he is pissed she was withheld this info, and he tells her if she ever goes near another soup again without his say-so, he'll come to her house, he'll kill her husband, her two little kids, and he'll kill her. And that's how this volume ends. And we're starting to see hints of a really darker side of Butcher here. So what did I think of The Boys Volume 4? I thought the X-Men parody was very fun to see play out and see all of those characters. I thought it was interesting having the Charles Xavier type character being a pedophile, and that's why he has all these kids around. I thought it was really fun hanging out with G-Wiz and that sort of Animal House parody. They are a fun group of guys to hang out with, minus their weird sexual habits. I thought the sexual perversion stuff being ramped up once again was maybe a little bit disappointing because I feel like Garth Ennis is just using it for like shock value. He's trying to shock you with these sort of weird sexual images where maybe it's not the most organic to the story, but nonetheless, small criticism, but uh, it's, it's always kind of funny still. I thought it was a little bit a good bit to have the G Coast and G style being these African American groups and they're having like a East Coast, a West Coast sort of rap beef with each other. That was kind of Fun. I thought it was an interesting sort of uh, political commentary, uh, but sort of about when people sort of protect abusers. So you see that now with the Me Too movement, where for decades, a lot of these high profile, powerful people uh, had people in their lives that knew the abuse was going on and they would help cover it up because they wanted to maintain the status quo. They wanted to keep making money and it was good for business. So just like John Godalkin and the G-Men sort of protected all those secrets, you have a lot of those same secrets happening in everyday life. So I thought that was sort of some interesting commentary in this. So overall, uh, I would give this volume an 8.5 out of 10. I think it was just as good as the past volumes. I wouldn't say it was better or worse, so I'm still going to maintain that 8.5 score. So that was volume 4. Volume 5 is called Herogasm. I'm going to try to get that out within the next week or so. So thank you for watching, and subscribe if you do not yet subscribe.